This is Unwind Your Mind Back to God Written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh In today's episode we continue Unlearning the World with Book 2 In Chapter 7, this is Section 5 Freedom is of the mind, not the body. Part 2 There are many forms of attack that are not seen as such. The mind in its deceived state does not even know what they are. In the special love relationship and various other sections, the Course says, that you do not know all the forms of attack. But if you can get clear about that, you can withdraw your mind from them. You can stop attacking yourself. In the holy instant, where the great rays replace the body in awareness, the recognition of relationships without limits is given you. Text Chapter 15, Section 9 Relationships Without Limits But in order to see this, it is necessary to give up every use the ego has for the body and to accept the fact that the ego has no purpose you would share with it. For the ego would limit everyone to a body for its own purposes. And while you think it has a purpose, you will choose to utilize the means by which it tries to turn its purpose into accomplishment. This will never be accomplished. Yet you have surely recognized that the ego, whose goals are altogether unattainable, will strive for them with all its might and will do so with the strength that you have given it. Text chapter 15, section 9, para 3 We gradually get more accustomed to a sense of mind, of abstractness. In a section called Beyond the Body, the Course says, Everyone has experienced what he would call a sense of being transported beyond himself. This feeling of liberation far exceeds the dream of freedom sometimes hoped for in special relationships. It is a sense of actual escape from limitations. If you will consider what this transportation really entails, you will realize that it is a sudden unawareness of the body and a joining of yourself and something else in which your mind enlarges to encompass it. It becomes part of you as you unite with it and both become whole as neither is perceived as separate. What really happens is that you have given up the illusion of a limited awareness and lost your fear of union. The love that instantly replaces it extends to what has freed you and unites with it. And while this lasts, you are not uncertain of your identity and would not limit it. You have escaped from fear to peace, asking no questions of reality, but merely accepting it. You have accepted this instead of the body and have let yourself be one with something beyond it, simply by not letting your mind be limited by it. Text Chapter 18 Section 6 And when people speak about near-death experiences, this passage always comes to mind. 
This can occur regardless of the physical distance that seems to be between you and what you join. Of your respective positions in space and of your differences in size and seeming quality. Time is not relevant. It can occur with something past, present or anticipated. The something can be anything and anywhere. A sound, a sight, a thought, a memory. And even a general idea without specific reference. Yet in every case, you join it without reservation because you love it and would be with it. And so you rush to meet it, letting your limits melt away, suspending all the laws your body obeys and gently setting them aside. Text chapter 18, section 6. In the next paragraph it says, You are not really lifted out of it. It cannot contain you. This is a great sentence. It gets away even from the idea of being lifted out of the body. Friend, There is no out-of-body experience. There is no in-the-body experience. David Jesus asks this question of us all. Do you want freedom of the body or of the mind? For both you cannot have. Text chapter 22, section 6 Whichever one you pick as the answer to this question you will use the other one as means. That is what we have done in our so-called lives in this world. We have picked the body as the end and used our minds as the means to serve the body. Now the Holy Spirit is suggesting a turnaround. You wanted to have a free mind, didn't you? Let me use your body to express miracles. The beginning of the section we just read is one of the clearest statements in the course about mind and body. Minds are joined, bodies are not. Text chapter 18, section 6 And here is an idea repeated over and over in the text and the workbook as well. Mind cannot attack. Text chapter 18, section 6 If minds could really attack, then guilt would be real and justified. The deceived mind is so convinced that minds can attack. It is so convinced that it is guilty. The section goes on about how the deceived mind tries to displace or get rid of the guilt which it believes is absolutely real. It is positively sure that it is guilty. It is convinced, locked in, split and fighting itself. This is one of the best sections of the course for getting into these two levels. Into the idea that minds are joined and bodies are not. The second paragraph in the section beyond the body really gets to the heart of the heart of it. First we see how the deceived mind tries to hold on to guilt. What could God give but knowledge of himself? What else is there to give? The belief that you could give and get something else, something outside yourself has cost you the awareness of heaven and of your identity. Text chapter 18, section 6, para 2 
Now he gets into the main thing that is going on with deception. And you have done a stranger thing than you yet realize. You have displaced your guilt to your body from your mind. Text chapter 18, section 6, para 2. The mind is so convinced that it is guilty. It is not going to try to mince words with God on this. Being convinced that it is guilty, it displaces its guilt onto the body. Yet a body cannot be guilty, for it can do nothing of itself. You who think you hate your body, deceive yourself. You hate your mind. Text, chapter 18, section 6, para 2. There it is. There are so many ways that people express hatred for their bodies. Like, oh, I am too fat or I am too thin. My body is breaking down. I turned 40. I turned 50. I turned 70. I'm getting old. I'm getting wrinkly. That is all just trying to dump the hate off on the body. You hate your mind. But as soon as we start to see how deep this hatred is, we can start to change the mind. Now that we know where the problem is, the body has nothing to do with it. He continues in that same section. You hate your mind, for guilt has entered into it, and it would remain separate from your brothers, which it cannot do. Text chapter 18, section 6 Minds are joined, bodies are not. Only by assigning to the mind the properties of the body does separation seem to be possible? Text chapter 18, section 6, para 3. This is where that whole idea of separate minds comes in. As if every person in this room has his own private mind. That is what the ego claims. But the Course says, no way. And it is the mind that seems to be fragmented and private and alone. Its guilt, which keeps it separate, is projected to the body, which suffers and dies because it is attacked to hold the separation in the mind and let it not know its identity. Text chapter 18, section 6, para 3. End of section. End of chapter.